Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Jedi. I'm one of the pastors here at Timber Lake. That, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, hey, so as you can see, Christmas Eve was amazing. I just want to say thank you to all of you who volunteered, who invited your friends to make that happen. It was a record-breaking year, the biggest Christmas Eve we've ever had, and it's so amazing to be a part of all that God is doing here at Timber Lake. All right, so uh, we're going to dive right in. When I was a kid, uh, I loved these things called stereograms. Anyone know what a stereogram is? All right, some of you, uh, do you remember the Magic Eye books? If I were to say Magic Eye, do you know what I'm talking about? Basically, there were these books where you would look at an image, like a 2D image, and you'd have to like look at it for a while and stare intently and kind of like make your eyes cross a little bit. And as your eyes crossed, a 3D image would pop out. And so uh, just for funsies, I thought that we should go through a few stereograms together, okay? So here's a stereogram. Let's look at one together, okay? So you're gonna look at the center of the screen, look intently for a while, uh, and then kind of, you know, let your eyes cross for a bit and see if something pops out at you. Uh, and I checked these, by the way, so if you see something inappropriate, that's between you and Jesus, um, <laughs> because all of them are good. They are clean, okay? All right, anyone see the first one? Anyone see anything that pops out? All right, in first service, we had a couple people. All right, the answer is an elephant. Boom, move over. Yeah, it's an elephant, okay? Okay, okay, that one was a little hard because the blades of grass can be tricky. Let's try the second one, the second one, all right? So go ahead and look at this. You see there's a bunch of like beads and stuff. Kind of look at it for a while and see if you make your eyes cross and something pops out at you. Does anyone see it? It's a donut, yes. Donut, okay, okay. The third one, okay? Let's look at the third one together. All right, this one's kind of tricky. So look intently. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you the answer to this. All right, flip it. It's actually Pastor Dave. That's what this one is <laughs> over here. Uh, actually, that's of course a joke. It's not Pastor Dave. Um, it's a dinosaur, okay? But some of you, if you thought it was Pastor Dave, you know, that's between you and Pastor Dave. I don't know. Uh, now, the reason why that I love stereograms is that uh, when you look at the image at first, it looks like a bunch of beads or grass or some like chaotic thing. But if you look at it for a while, what you find is that there's a hidden image that pops out. And the journey of discovering what's hidden is a lot of fun to me. And so this morning, I want to look at a passage in the Bible that to me feels like a stereogram. Okay, I want to look at a passage in the book of Revelation. Now, most of the time... Uh, if you're a new Christian or if you're exploring Christianity for the first time, you don't start your biblical journey in Revelation, okay? And the reason why, because uh, some of you might have tried this, where you open it up and you read about like a dragon and you read about these four horsemen who are gonna like ravage the earth uh, and, and, you, and you read about the mark of the beast and you're like, no, I'm done. I can't, I can't do that, okay? Uh, living with kids during winter break was enough, um, getting through Christmas with the in-laws was enough. Like 2023 was hard enough. I don't want to do the end of the world. Now, the reason why I want to go into Revelation is because I think that this passage looks like a stereogram. And so we're going to look at it together and find the message that God has hidden for us in 2024, okay? So this is Revelation chapter three, starting at verse 14. And it's a bit lengthy bit of scripture, so hang with me. This is what it says. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. He's referring to Jesus, by the way. Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Anything else, Jesus? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Ouch, spicy, right? That's like 10 star level spice. Uh, but again, it's a stereogram. So I know what it looks like at first. It looks like a harsh judgment, I get it. But hang with me. 
All right, these words are written by a man named John, and he's writing about Jesus, uh, writing to the church in Laodicea. Now, some scholars believe that this was an actual church in Laodicea, which would be in present-day Turkey. But there are other scholars who believe that because this is an apocalyptic text about the end of the world, that these seven churches are representative, metaphorically, of the kinds of faith communities that would arise over the church's history. Now, I tend to like that view, uh, and I think that it has something to say to us today. So, it looks like a harsh judgment. And some of you may have been feeling your defenses coming up as we started reading, as I started going through that. And the reason is, is that you may have heard a teaching on this before, where a person weaponized this text against you and basically said that because you weren't on fire for God and you weren't doing all the right things, that God was about to be done with you and he was about to say, it's over, I'm finished. And if you don't turn into a super Christian and give all of your money and do all the right things, then God will forever spurn you away. You may have heard that text, and you may be like, yeah, I don't want that because that's not what uh, I'm about. But can I also tell you that that's not the heart of Jesus in this passage? Again, this is a stereogram. So I know it looks like judgment, but I promise you there's something else hidden within it. So what does it say? Well, Jesus says, hey, the people in this church are neither hot or cold. They're lukewarm. And because of that, he's about to spit them out. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what does it mean to be lukewarm? Now, some of you might be drinking lukewarm coffee right now, right? You may have gotten it from the lobby, and instead of being piping hot, you know, or, or like maybe you went to Starbucks this morning, or Mercury's, your favorite place, you know, and getting the kids in the car and all this kind of stuff took a little bit more time, and you go to take that coffee, and it's supposed to be hot, but it's not. It's lukewarm. Ugh, gross. Not my thing. Or maybe um, you imagine it's summertime and you're hanging out the lake, or some of you might be in Hawaii right now, somewhere beautiful, and you're really, really hot and you want something cold and refreshing, and so someone gives you a drink but forgets to put ice in it, and it comes from one of those gallon things, and it ends up being like warm lemonade. How many of you love warm lemonade? Yeah, exactly. No one. It's lukewarm. So you probably end up spitting it out or not drinking it or doing something. Now, that's what lukewarm feels like. And when we talk about it in the context of lemonade or coffee, it can be funny. But when we talk about it in the context of relationships, it's something altogether different. So my wife, Sarah, and I, uh, we met in college. I guess you could say that we were college sweethearts. And when we first met, it was an interesting time. We met at the University of Texas, and I was going to be transferring to a different school, uh, like in a month. And that's when we first started kind of talking. And so I had to figure out a way where I could talk to her because I was interested in her, but I didn't want her to think I was interested in her. You know what I mean? Like, I had to figure out a way to like talk to her and kind of like see if, you know, this was gonna work or whatnot without her thinking I was interested in her. So play, I gotta play. So I was texting her and messaging her. Uh, and, and, and in those days, you know, it's not like what you have today, right? It was like AOL days, for those of you guys who remember that. So it was a very different time. And, we, and I was like asking her out on dates and I was buying her gifts and we were going to have all this stuff. And, and, and basically, there was one time, maybe it was around our fifth date where we were hanging out, you know, I was still like, yeah, I'm kind of into you, but not into you, but kind of into you, not into you. And we were drinking coffee. And I remember it got awkwardly quiet and she kind of like looked me in the eyes, just kind of like this. And she was like, what is this? And I was like, it's a vanilla latte is what it is. And she was like, no, what are we? Like, what is this? Like, what are you doing? What are we doing? Are we something or are we not? And I was like, buh, 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 buh. <laughs> I was being lukewarm. And my wife, future wife, that future girlfriend, was calling me out on it. So when we get in the context of relationships, it's different. And that's kind of what's happening in this passage. Jesus is writing to these people in Laodicea, and he's saying, hey, what is this? Are you in or are you out? You're not hot or cold, and I kind of wish you were one or the, the other because this, this isn't cool. It's not jiving with me. Now, people become lukewarm for all types of reasons. And in the text, it happened like this. It said that they had grown wealthy and prosperous and eventually lost their dependence for God. Now, this ought to cause all of us to slow down because in this room, right, almost every one of us are incredibly wealthy compared to the rest of the world. 
Some of us are even wealthy uh, compared to American standards. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, that's great. It's amazing. In the Bible, God made many people like Abraham and Joseph, David, Solomon, and even Job incredibly wealthy as one of the signs of his blessing on their life. I hope that I'm always growing in resources and in personal wealth. And so wealth isn't the problem. The problem is that when life gets good, sometimes a little too good, it's easy to lose sight of our need for God and to depend less on him. Now, I think very few people actually look to the heavens and say, aha, I got money in my bank, I don't need you anymore. No one does that. What ends up happening over the course of time is that we naturally just drift a little bit. Like a ship that's on the ocean, it's going in a certain direction. Things like currents and winds can make it go in one way or the other. And if the person who's navigating that ship doesn't keep that course clear, what will happen is that it'll change by two or three degrees. And that ship, over the course of time, will end up in a place that it never expects to be. And that's what drift looks like in our lives. Maybe you were in a place where, um, you know, like you needed God to do something amazing. And so, you know, faith was like great and you were like praying and you were connected. And all of a sudden, things got good. Maybe he healed you and restored you and you got more confident. And just over the course of time, you didn't turn to God as much because you didn't have to because of what he did. Have you ever felt that way where you drifted a little bit? Now, some people drift because things get good, but I think there's lots of reasons why people drift. Sometimes, you know, we drift because our schedules get so busy that we just don't have time anymore. You know, or maybe we're enjoying and pursuing the benefits of hard work and the comfort that God has blessed us with, that we just kind of drift. Or maybe we get hit with something unexpected like a new diagnosis or a financial challenge or loneliness or shame and we never really recover. Maybe for some of us, we take a step further and we think that God is the one who blame, is to blame for that, that he caused that thing that's happening and so we're angry at God and we kind of drift. You may be here and you've never believed in Jesus and you're not a Christian, but even you know what drift feels like. I mean, how many of us are about to make New Year's resolution and fail miserably? If you look at the research, it says about 90% of you are about to fail, okay? And I just want you to know that's okay. We have a low shame culture at Timberlake. You're always welcome here. The research, I looked at one study and it said that 23% of people fail by the end of week one and that 43% of people quit by the end of January. Talk about drift. Now, whether you get there intentionally, unintentionally, we all drift and it happens. And it's not a great experience, not for us or for God. I get the privilege and honor of leading and mentoring several residents in our residency program. And uh, they're like people who are in their 20s. It's basically like a two-year program where you can come and be developed for future pastoral leadership and, and ministry. Uh, and it's fun. We have some amazing residents. You get to see them on stage. You see them in different ministries across the church. But there are times when I don't understand what they're saying because of the words that they use, okay? And so I've had to ask them to clarify for me what they actually mean when they use certain phrases and I want to share them with you so that if someone comes up to you and says something, you understand what they're trying to say, okay? All right, so you go and learn today. The first word is cracked. Everyone say cracked. Okay, cracked. Cracked is not when someone is like really dry and forgets to lotion up and they're cracked. Cracked is when someone is really good at something. All right, let's say like your mom bakes an amazing cake and you're like, yo, your mom bakes an amazing cake, man, like at baking, she's cracked. Because that makes sense, right? So if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I think you're cracked, like don't get mad or punch them in the face. They're trying to say you're really good at it, okay? And so the next time, you know, like someone is amazing at something, you say, hey, I think you're, you're cracked. You know, that's cracked. All right, the second word, okay, is the word riz, Riz. Okay, now for those of you who are like, oh, goodness. It, it comes from charisma, okay, to clarify. And this word is related to like the quality or the essence of a person who's attractive or, you know, they're very appealing. And so if someone's good looking or if they're beautiful, like you're like, yo, that person's got riz. They got riz. So if someone comes up to you and says, hey, 
I just gotta tell you, I saw you across the room and you got riz. <laughs> Don't punch him in the face. All right, they're just trying to tell you that they're attracted to you is all they're trying to do. Makes no sense, but that's what it means, okay? And then the next word is bet. Okay, everyone say bet. Bet, okay. Bet is basically a term of agreement. It's basically saying, okay, all right? So uh, Isaiah, who's one of our residents, I love him, he's a great guy. Let's say he texts me, like right now in the middle of my message, I don't know why he would do that, but let's say he does that. And he says, hey, let's go get some pho after church, man. Like yummy pho and Redmond is the spot. Let's go eat some lunch. And I could be like, bet. That's it. I don't have to say yes or no. I can say bet. And bet basically means okay, all right? All right, so the next time like someone messages you and they're like, hey, I really think we should go maybe try this thing or like, you know, like I, I kind of want to like maybe spend some time by myself and you go, okay, cool, bet. That's it, bet. All right, this word is the last one and it's kind of related to what we're talking about today, which is the word mid, mid. It's neither high or low, it's just kind of mid. Let's say you're on a date and you're like, you know, kind of connecting with this person that you met on Hinge or something and you're having a good time and you're feeling confident, and so you're like, hey, how's it going? And she says, it's mid. <laughs> That's not necessarily a good thing, you know? <laughs> you might want to adjust your confidence a little bit. Uh, mid, mid is not great, <laughs> right? It's just kind of in the middle. It's mid. That's what it means to be lukewarm. All right, lukewarm is kind of mid. Now, the reason why God doesn't like this isn't because of what you think. Right? It's not because God is angry or wanting to punish you or he's wanting to push you away. Right? He doesn't like lukewarm because what happens in our lukewarm states is that we're neither hot or cold. We're kind of like this. And when you're kind of like this, things on the inside, like you're either growing or you're not. And if you're kind of like this out here inside, things start dying away. And so what Jesus says about these people in Laodicea is that, look, you say you're okay on the outside. You look okay but I actually see what's really happening. And this is what he says about them in verse 17. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And this is when the stereogram starts to come in effect and we start to see the hidden message. Jesus cares about these people. He genuinely cares about them and what they're going through. And while they're pushing him away and saying that they don't need him and trying to posture life and, and do their own thing, he's saying, no, I really see what's going on. You're hurting and you're bound and you're struggling and I want to come and help you with that. Now, this is really sobering because none of us are as strong or as smart or as independent as we think we are. And even though our lives can look amazing on Instagram because of filters and all the things that we do to make it look good, we can actually be hurting on the inside and struggling. And in those moments, in our moments of drift, God doesn't come to give us judgment. Look, look what it says here in verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking and if that person opens the door, it says that he will come in and eat with them and they with him. It doesn't say I will come in and eat you alive or I will come in and tell you how bad you are or I will come in with the list of things that you should be doing that you haven't been doing or I will come in and end things with you. No. He says, I will come in and share a meal with you. It's a beautiful invitation of friendship, mutuality, connection, and love. And what we see hidden in this biblical stereogram this morning is this truth. When we drift in life, Jesus doesn't give us judgment. He offers us relationship. When we drift in life, Jesus doesn't give us judgment. He offers us relationship, connection. And I know that's tricky because you're like, whoa, 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 he's the almighty God and I'm just a small human and I, I, can't, I can't be connected with him, but it's true. The hidden message in this passage is an invitation. 
And so I think there's three parts to this invitation, and I want to go through it really quickly in the rest of our time together. The first thing is that I think that it's an invitation to see God differently. For some of us, if we're honest, we kind of see God in this way, okay? God is out there somewhere in a galaxy far, far away. Yes, that was a Jedi joke for those who kind of got that. And he's on this celestial plane with a bunch of people, I don't know, heavenly beings worshiping him and stuff, and he's keeping tabs. He's observing us. And if you do good, then he blesses you. But if you don't do good, then he goes, oh, I have to withhold that blessing. Oh, let that bad thing happen. And he kind of is removed from human life and our everyday activities. Now, if this is your image of God, you will follow God in a very religious way. You'll show up and do all the religious things that you have to to kind of get a good life. But eventually what will happen is you'll realize that you'll never feel good enough and you'll be caught and stuck in a cycle of sin management where you'll be managing your external behavior, trying to get the approval of a divine being who's somewhere out there. That is not the gospel. It's not Christianity. That's not what the Bible is about. The Bible actually says the complete opposite that everything given to us by God is given to us through his grace, that we don't earn his favor. It's given to us as a free gift. If you follow God in this way, it'll be more like a religion to you, but what God wants is relationship, and relationship will change you. Relationship is something altogether different. My wife and I, we've been married for 16 years, and dated for three years before that. And so 20 years, okay, this person has been in my life. God bless her, you know. Uh, She's been on a journey. When we first got married, though, uh, she was like, hey, I need to talk to you about your clothes. So I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, we can talk about clothes. That's great. Uh, I had noticed that some of my T-shirts, you know, like the free ones that I got in the quad were, like, disappearing. Um, You know, like the ones that were all ripped and, like, had special memories were, like, going away and being replaced with nicer clothes. So I thought... She was gonna, we were gonna talk about that. But she came to me and she said, here's what, here's what I want you to know, okay? What you're wearing right now, what I'm wearing right now, are my outside clothes, okay? And then she showed me a pile of T-shirts and shorts and said, these are your home clothes. Uh, and so when you come home, I want you to get out of your outside clothes and into your home clothes that you wear in your house, okay? So I was like, okay, I, outside, home, I think I can. And then she said, And over here, there was another pile of like shirts and t-shirts. And she said, these are your bed clothes. These clothes are meant to be worn when you're in bed and only when you're in bed. And I I couldn't tell the difference between the t-shirts and the shorts because they look the same. And so I said, well, how am I supposed to tell the difference? And she said, I have deemed that these are bed clothes. I have deemed that these are home clothes. You need to figure it out. Okay, now, I told this story in first service and people thought I was exaggerating, okay? I'm not exaggerating. I'm actually telling a true story. This is what my life was like for like the first 10 years of our marriage pre-kids, okay? I will preface it by saying, she has loosened her standards uh, and life has a bit more freedom now, okay? Uh, And if you're like, yo, are you about to like get like a divorce letter? Like, does she know you're telling the story? Yes, she knows I'm telling the story, okay? So, uh, but this is a real story. This was my life. I would come home outside Um, I would come home and be in my outside clothes. I'd have to take off my outside clothes and put on my home clothes. And I would go about my business, doing my home stuff. Uh, But if I had to go back outside, I would have to get out of my home clothes and put on my outside clothes. And I have to go and be like, oh, I forgot my backpack in the car, get my backpack, come back inside, come out of my home clothes or outside clothes into my home clothes. And then it's time for bed, right? And so I'll brush my teeth, whatever, do all that, and then go out of my home clothes into my bed clothes. But if in the middle of the night I got thirsty, I'd have to get out of my bed clothes and into my home clothes to go to the kitchen to get some water. And then if I come into my bed clothes and then, I don't know, there's a noise outside and Sarah's like, you gotta go check it out. So I gotta go out of my bed clothes into my outside clothes. This was my life, okay? And can I tell you something? This is, this is what's funny about love and what's funny about relationship. Now when I travel, I have hotel clothes that I pack for myself because I love my home clothes and my outside clothes and my bed clothes. I love it. And I can tell you story after story after story of how my wife and I have influenced each other. 
You, you might think, hey, that's crazy, but you know what? It works for us and we are madly in love. And that's the thing about relationship, isn't it? That relationship changes you. It changes the way you think about the world or the way you think about clothes or the way you think about yourself. And some of us are following God in a religious way where God is out there and we're over here and he's saying, no, I want to be connected to you in relationship. And that's scary because what, what, what do you mean you wanna be connected to me? Well, I'm trying to hide things from you. I'm trying to keep things hidden so that I can approve of your love. And God is saying, no, I wanna be connected to you so that those things that are hidden, I could free you from. Those things that are hidden, I could heal you from. Those things that are, you're struggling with, I can help you with. And so this invitation is an invitation to see God differently. Secondly, it's an invitation to see ourselves clearly. All right, some of us, like the people in Laodicea, we think that life is good, and we look fine and amazing on the outside, but in, inside, we're struggling. And I just want you to know, if that's you today, that's okay. You don't have to front here. You don't have to put on that happy face and say that you're whatever you think you are. You don't have to do that. What God offers is an opportunity for us to be honest and to come to him. Now, for others, it's the opposite. We have such a low view of ourselves because of all that's happened throughout the course of our lives, whether that was in our families or, or painful experiences from friends or past experiences or what we hear on social media and all the lies of what we have to do to belong. It's easy to believe that we're unworthy of love, and that we don't have purpose. The reason why lukewarm feels good is because we think that somehow that's all our life is meant to be. But the Bible tells us something completely different. It says that you and I were created in the image of God to be in relationship with him. That each of us have unique abilities and gifts and a purpose that God wants us to live into. Jesus said that I have come to give them life and life to the full. St. Augustine, he's one of the most prolific thinkers in early Christianity. He had a crazy story. And he wrote about it in an autobiography called Confessions. It's filled with forbidden love affairs, mistresses, and lots of alcohol. Uh, so much so that he's the patron saint for both uh, brewers and for theologians. And so uh, he actually writes about all of his crazy escapades, but there's this line that I love. He says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Your heart and my heart, our hearts are restless until they rest in Jesus, in God. And so it's an invitation to see God differently, an invitation to see ourselves clearly. And lastly, if you can do those two things, it's an invitation to a different kind of life. God wants you to have a full, abundant life, much different than the one that you've currently been living. You know, I know that as we look uh, towards 2024, it's crazy, right? We made it. Some of you are like, yes, this year is over because it was rough. And some of you are like, man, this year was amazing. I loved it. I was living my best life. Regardless of where you are, I want you to hear this beautiful invitation again. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. When we drift in life, Jesus doesn't give us judgment. He offers us relationship. Now, the reason why this is hard and the reason why this is actually difficult is because the key to unlocking that is surrender. The key to unlocking that is surrender. It's the, it's the key that opens the door to relationship and it requires letting go of the things that we're holding on to. When my daughter Elise, who's seven now, was little, uh, she used to do this thing where you used to clench her hands really tightly, kind of like you see in this picture. She would hold her hands really, really tight. And uh, we noticed that, like, she just, she wouldn't open her hands. She would just keep them like this. And we'd have to, like, pry them open and kind of clean them, and then she would go right back to clenching them. And eventually, over the course of time, uh, her hands got kind of funky, and we call them her cheese hands because they smell gross. Yeah, some of your parents are nodding like, you understand what this is. And we'd be like, why does she have cheese hands? We talked to doctors and nurses and they didn't understand what was going on, but she had cheese hands, whatever. Uh, and we'd open them up and clean them and she'd clench. Here's the thing. Some of you, I know it sounds gross, but some of you 
have spiritual cheese hands. You've been holding on so tightly to all of those things and you've been praying and hoping that life would look different, that God would show up in a different way and every time he comes to give you stuff, you can't receive it. What you need to do is open those hands, allow him to wash them, and just create some room to receive. My hope and prayer for you is this. Regardless of where you are, regardless of how you think you're doing in your faith journey, when we drift, God doesn't give us judgment. He offers us relationship. What if at the beginning of 2024, that was the thing that you finally said yes to? What if you finally said, I'm gonna surrender and open that door, Jesus, and allow you to change my life? What would that look like? For me, I, I went through a crazy traumatic life. I went through lots of things. Um, I shouldn't even be here, honestly. And um, sometimes in my relationships, my responses and my reactions are triggers from painful memories, from environments of abuse and toxicity. And God has been saying, that's not what I've destined you for. I want you to let go of that. Let me wash you clean and allow you to step into a different kind of life. Maybe for you, that means that you sign up for a group and actually go. Or you check out a different group because that first group was weird. You didn't like it. Maybe you finally decide to take the plunge and get baptized. I've known so many people who have said, you know, I just, I don't know. And then when they go do it, they're like, it was the best thing. Maybe you decide to put God first in your marriage and do the work together to let go of resentment and rebuild trust. Maybe you believe God's unconditional love for you and choose to let go of perfectionism and give yourself some self-compassion. Or maybe you let go of that toxic relationship and you say, enough is enough. I'm gonna walk into something that God has for me moving forward. Maybe you decide to believe in Jesus for the very first time or for the first time in a really long time. Whatever it is, I wanna encourage you to take that step today because when we drift in life, Jesus doesn't give us judgment. He offers us relationship. And when we say yes to that, changes everything. I've asked the team to sing a song called Make Room. It's gonna be a new song for many of you. Uh, my hope is that it's, it's your prayer for today. And if you just wanna sit and receive the words or, or hear the words as you're standing and you don't wanna sing along, that's okay. If you wanna sing along and make that your confession of faith, that's okay. When we drift in life, Jesus doesn't give us judgment. He offers us relationship. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I'm so grateful for every person here, for the ways that you love them, the ways that you've created them. And God, I'm so thankful for all that you have for them in this next year. Regardless of what 2023 was, God, I pray that we would all be able to open our hands and surrender ourselves and create a little bit of room to receive what you have for us. What you have for us isn't judgment. It's not punishment. It's not harsh. What you have for us is love, joy, peace, purpose, a different kind of life. And Lord, if there are people who are hearing my voice who've never accepted you in their life, I pray, God, that they would just say a simple confession of faith, that they would turn to you and ask you to be the Lord and leader of their life. Just say, Jesus, I need you. And I want you to be the Lord and leader of my life. And as it has been for millions of people throughout history, that confession is enough to go from death to life because of what Jesus has done for us. Lord, we want all that you have for us. And so we make room for you in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching. But before you go, please be sure to bookmark this page so that you can find us again next week. And are you looking for a way to get engaged and join a team? The online chat engagement team is a role that anyone and everyone can do, and it's simple. Engage with people, create an environment where people are free to be themselves, and more importantly, open to receive the truth of Jesus. And if you're interested in joining this team and becoming part of what God is doing through Timberlake Online, please let me know on your connection card. Links can be found in chat, and I'll see you here next week at online.timberlakechurch.com.
Tā kā.